I've been planning these as a series of lectures which then gets converted into a book. Who was very kind enough to introduce me to a publisher. And actually, I have signed a contract. So later this year, it will be a book. Um, the idea is to explore and position the philosophical underpinnings of modern Indian conservatism. And I'm looking at it in contemporary action terms in five spheres the economic, the cultural, the social, the political, and the aesthetic. However, between today and Thursday, I'm only going to cover the cultural and the political. Um, the other three um, will require more time, and uh, since I'm going to be staying on campus, if any of you are interested, I'm happy to talk about them. No such attempt can possibly cover everything comprehensive. Indian conservatism has received scant attention from academia and rarely occupies media presence unless it is in its most caricature form. Its relationship to Western Burkean traditions and to indigenous intellectual sources going back to antiquity have rarely been seen as worth exploring or understanding, let alone celebrating. Intellectually discourse in India in the 20th century, especially its second half and into the current century, has been dominated by paradigms borrowed from the metropolitan centers of the West. The grammars used have been Marxist, Freudian, postmodern, and so on, with India contributing a somewhat of the historical school within the postmodern dialogues. This has been the case also with intellectual discourse about India in Western academia and journalist circles. A certain amount of political discourse not fully acknowledged as intellectual by academia has had a particularly Hindu nationalist flavor associated with it. This point of view has so far remained on the peripheries of academic respectability, which has not been confirmed or it willingly, but within the entrenched cloisters of university in India or in the West. Any attempt at seriously studying conservatism, let alone contributing to an ongoing intellectual conversation with it, has been avoided simply by using the assumption that, at least in the political sphere, it is nothing but a Siamese twin attached to what is externally described as Hindu nationalism. This attempt at defining conservatism by its intellectual adversaries ensconced in powerful academic positions, and in so attempting also limiting its appeal, has I believe not been constructive for the broader development of healthy, mutually respectful points of view in conversation with each other. Students and the general public end up as losers the various brilliant strands and schools of conservative thought are excluded from study and contemplation. I, for one, would reject the position that Hindu nationalism is not a respectable political doctrine worth studying. However, the fundamental argument that keeps recurring is whether Hindu nationalism is a subset within the broad tent of Indian conservatism, or whether it is the case that Indian, conserv Indian conservatism and Hindu have some elements that overlap and others that do not. This is particularly highlighted when we confront extreme and violent elements of the Hindu nationalist fold. While moderate Hindu nationalism, which emphasizes Indian cultural unities, can be seen as a legitimate movement within a broader conservative umbrella, Hindu extremism remains more problematic. Modern conservatism is a school of social and political philosophy is usually dated back to Edmund Burke, the 18th century British thinker, politician, and writer. Conservatives held themselves to large dollars from Hobbes, Locke, Adam Smith, David Hume, <coughs> Madison, and Hamilton, thus giving much weightage to Anglo-Saxon thinkers and traditions. The idea that conservative thinking is frozen in time or hawks back always to a golden past 
is a caricature presented by his opponents. Conservatism has evolved, and there have been intense, intense debates on people who describe themselves or are externally described as conservatives. The conservative tradition in Britain has come down to political practitioners like Robert Peel and the celebrated Benjamin Disraeli, all the way down to Margaret Thatcher. The best known conservative philosopher in Britain today is Roger Scruton, who can be seen as an intellectual descendant of Henry Bain and Frederick Mainton. Conservatism is a school of philosophy which is not characterized by rigid contours or definitions. It believes that human beings as individuals and as communities have evolved over time, developing laws, institutions, cultures, norms, and associations. This evolutionary process undoubtedly contributes to practical utility. The process itself is one of trial and error. It is grounded in a deep sense of empiricism, focused heavily on what works on the ground and what is practical. It is suspicious, even dismissive, of utopian fantasies. And the point of view repeatedly asserted is that human beings seeking utopias are likely to end up in dystopias. In fact, conservatives would take the position that perfection cannot be achieved by individuals or societies. We must necessarily be satisfied with modest improvements, but improvements nevertheless, not regressions. The Scottish philosopher David Hume articulated this sense of empiricism and combined it with a consistent anti utopian position. He and his compatriot Adam Smith were great believers in the ongoing improvement of human society, ideas which Pinker and Ariely put forth in contemporary times. The conservative position is that improvements have to be gradual and preferably peaceful. Sudden violent attempts at so-called improvements are viewed with suspicion because they are likely to backfire, destroy much of the good in the past, and present and deliver a situation substantially worse than the earlier one. A philosophical approach involving the acceptance of the inevitability of violence is also resented by conservatives on both model and practical counts. Conservatives have as their primary concern the freedom and well-being of individuals. Freely formed, voluntary, organic, associative institutions are viewed positively, while state-sponsored collectives are many times viewed as inimical to individual interests. This does not mean a conservative advocate, anarchist, or extreme libertarian positions. Au contraire, Conservatives attach a great deal of importance to horizontal social cohesion within limited geographies referred to as villages, towns, or countries. The best articulation of this idea of voluntary mutual bonding of people is a literary one and comes from the finest of Anglo Saxon writers. In Shakespeare's Henry V, the bard has young King Harry say to the assembled soldiers, before the Battle of Agent Court, on that now famous St. Crispin's Day, that the entire English army, which included aristocratic lords and yeoman peasants, were in fact part of the king's band of brothers. Even if some of the men present on the battlefield were conscripted, Henry treated them as volunteers, emphasizing the free association of free individuals. We are confronted with a strong English state that gains its strength from a shared social and political vision. This is what Roger Scruton describes as a shared public realm of mutual loyalty. And Alexis de Tocqueville refers to when he describes New England town meetings of all citizens. We must hasten to add that for conservatives, the idea of a band of brothers does not imply a leveling mediocre equality that socialists love. It refers to a shared solidarity across different, distinct persons bound by mutual loyalty. For religious conservatives, equality is in the eyes of God and of the law. And for those who are not that religious, it is in the eyes of law only, no more and no less. Conservatives emphasize that shared loyalty is required not in order to restrict individual freedom 
but in order to give that freedom, break the salience and be. Despite not being utopian in its pretensions, conservatism has a universal flavor to it. There are conservatives in all countries, societies, and spheres. While the origin of the modern political doctrine of conservatism has a distinctly Anglo-Saxon flavor to it, one can argue that the roots of conservative thinking go back in the Western canon, all the way to Plato, Aristotle, Isaiah, and the Gospels. This, of course, by no means makes conservatism in India purely or entirely an important intellectual conceit. Its antecedents are both universal and Indian. Two of our civilization's foundational texts, the Shanti Parva of the Mahabharata and the Tirupural of Tiruvalluva, can be seen as providing the enduring basis of Indian conservatism. Kautilya, although controversial, has some conservative credentials. While dealing with the gradual emergence of new humanism, Allah Sami Pendano approaches Scruton's concern with a refreshing panache some 500 years before school. The Mahabharata and the Tirupural deal with the three pursuits of humankind. Artha or economic and political activity, the Kama or the pursuit of passion and beauty, and Dharma or the pursuit of virtue and mankind. The fourth pursuit, Moksha or salvation, presumably the most important, is automatically dealt with the first three items. The discussions on dharma focus on three very important ideas, some samskaras or character traits, which can also be read as charitra, raja dharma, and sukshma dharma. Charitra refers to character, the character of individuals, of groups, and of the sovereign. Individuals are required to focus on their duties and obligations prior to seeking rights. Mahatma and Gandhi actually took the position that when duties are properly performed, rights will automatically fall. Groups of individuals are expected to live together peacefully and peacefully and to transact with each other in a trustworthy manner. The sovereign is required to have a good character and not derive joy from tyranny. Kalidasa's Raghuvamsha depicts with great sorrow the tragedy of land having an evil king. Raja Dharma, or the appropriate virtuous conduct of a king, is repeatedly described as that conduct which promotes the happiness of subjects. It is almost as if the Indic sages anticipate Jefferson's, Jefferson's position that the state needs to create an atmosphere where individuals can pursue happiness. Raja Dharma, to some extent, anticipates the Magna Carta in suggesting that the sovereign is not above the law. Raja Dharma requires that individuals be protected, an obvious forerunner the Jeffersonian idea of protecting life and liberty. The sovereign is required to act in a manner that prevents the emergence of Matsya Nyaya, or the situation where the big fish eat the small fish. Nothing is more horrifying than Matsya Nyaya for ancient Indian thinkers. A state that protects is key, and of course that implies that the state itself is not predatory. This idea is elaborated on quite a bit by F.W. Maitland, who places it within the traditions of English common law. Raja Dharma would require the sovereign to maintain domestic tranquility, an objective recorded by the American founding fathers right in the piano. It would require the sovereign to protect the life and property of citizens. The question of the state expropriating property is vigorously negated in the Ishavasi Upanishad which explicitly forbids the coveting of another's wealth, a maxim which applies to kings and commoners equally. Sushma Dharma asks a question about the appropriate response to situations where trade-offs are required. When creative tension is experienced between conflicting actions which appear equally virtuous, the answers are never easy. But Indic texts are clear. One can, cannot avoid these questions because they are difficult. The river doer is most emphatic that the answers must pass the test of practical empiricism. Another concept that which I will frequently refer to is that of yoga dharma, which goes back some two and a half millennia. The concept of yoga dharma suggests that correct conduct changes with time. 
yuga means age or epoch or time period each yuga requires different responses from the virtuous the next sentence that i want to say is very central to my whole thesis the parallels between these robust indian traditions and anglo-saxon conservatism can be seen as accidental or, exa or as examples of human synchronicity let us switch gears and consider names associated with modern indian conservatism focusing for the time being on the pre-independence era the first is ram mohan roy who was a political conservative and a supporter of british rule while being a social and religious reformer. A reformer and not a radical. The second is Bakil Chandra Chatterjee, who can be characterized as being almost a founder of Hindu conservatism. It is Bakil who ensured that Hindu nationalism had intellectual respectability as a positive and credible point of view. Bakil was also among the first to articulate a Hindu identity in contemporary language. He borrowed from Sanskritic sources and wove them into strands that made sense in the language of his times. That is a characteristic conservative exercise. The question is frequently asked as to whether Hindu nationalism, by its very Hindu and very nationalistic nature, can be a branch of conservatism at all. This needs to be viewed contextually. The emancipator Lincoln referred to the mystic cords of memory that bind people together. When you combine this with the fact that the British conquered India and pretty openly took the position that they had conquered it from predominantly Muslim rulers, it becomes clear that non-Muslims in India are taking into account that the very expression Hindu was an evolving one, had no option but to seek a renaissance if they were to sustain themselves as a community with scrutinesque shared mutual loyalty rather than as atomized splinters. Bunkin and Lalpat Rai, along with several others, realized that a shared Hindu cultural identity would be the basis of overcoming vertical and horizontal boundaries among Hindus like caste. They would then be a band of brothers. Therein lies the origin of seeking an imagined Hindu identity in the Anderson mode, Benedict Anderson mode, while acknowledging the myriad diversities present inside that construct. A renaissance as against a brand new identity implies that the mystic cord of memory is an enduring one, even if there have been major political and social discontinuities over time. To dismiss this approach as reactionary is less than fair. It is a branch of conservatism, even if it sought substantive change from prevalent circumstances of its times. Banke was less sanguine about British rule than Ram Mohan. But he too was a supporter of British rule insofar as he makes the argument that British rule was providential for Hindus, helping ignite a Hindu revival and renaissance. Swami Vivekananda too shared the view that there was a providential opportunity for Hindus that was provided by association with the British. Vivekananda preferred to include Muslims and Christians within an Indian cultural rubric, acknowledging that both for historical and for demographical reasons, this Indian culture would have a large dose of a Hindu character. Arguably, there is nothing inherently illegitimate or undemocratic about such a position. Scruton would argue that respecting the majority culture does not imply support for majoritarian positions. And given Indian diversities, which we will presently discuss, the majority culture emerges as a benign rainbow rather than as a threatening pool too. In economics, the pre-independence era conservative thinkers included Dadavai Navaroji and Ramesh Chandra Historians of this period who can be classified as conservatives included Jadunath Sarkar, Radha Kumar Mukherjee, Ramaswamy Aingar, K. Munshi, Mazumdar, Parasnes, Sandesai, and Nirakantra Shastri. Dimesh Chakrabarti, who by no means can be classified as a conservative, has incisively analyzed Sarkar's views on character and its role in determining historical destiny. Das Gupta, Hiriyana, and Radhakrishnan brought the conservative perspective to philosophical studies in India. The career of Radhakrishnan crossed over to the post-1947 era. The great sociologist, sociologist Bourrier, who started before 1947, 
went on quite a bit after that, was definitely a conservative. He was concerned about organic processes within India that lead to a gradual change accumulating over time and the resulting creation of a civilized society. In the field of aesthetics, the best known conservative thinker of that era was Ananda Kentesh Kumaraswamy. In the post-1885 period, as the Indian National Congress grew in importance, the most important conservative political figure to emerge was Gopal Krishna Bhokte. Under his leadership, the Congress was committed to debate, discussion, and negotiation, working for gradual, evolutionary, constitutional political change. Social activists like Ranade and Garve were deeply concerned that excessive focus on political change without social change also happening may actually end up being counterproductive. They were advocates of social change through discussion, legislation, persuasion, and example. A similar impulse on the economic, scientific, and technological <coughs> side drove J.N. Tata. Tata was concerned about human capital in India. In his celebrated letter to Gokhale, he laments the fact, he laments the fact that the colonial education system produced too many lawyers and not enough scientists, engineers, and practical persons. In this regard, he was following in the footsteps of his fellow citizen of Bombay, the renowned Jagannath Shankarshay, who had similar concerns in the area of education and worked actively with Governor Elephants to encourage education in the then Bombay presidency. Concerns about education and social change, oddly enough, were very important to persons who may not completely fit the conservative label. Persons like Yoti Das, Jyoti Bhule, Cornelia Swarabji, Pandita Ranade, Bairamji Malabari, and Ramaswamy Nayaka, all of whom supported the continuance of British rule, at least until Indian education levels were higher and Indian society had comprehensively embraced principles of individualism and meritocracy. Individualism, emphasis on individual human agency, which was always supposed to trump the tyranny of collective identities while not disregarding the inherited wisdom of communities, remains one of those fine balancing acts that conservative philosophers love to participate in. The focus on agency ensures that collective victimhood, collective entitlements without appropriate action on the part of individuals and communities themselves, grievance mourning by mongering, as well as entrenched non-meritocratic hierarchies tend to be looked down upon by conservatives. It is important to note that Jyotiba Pule worked with another conservative scholar, Vandakar, to set up schools and institutions rather than succumb to the temptation of sloganeering and the culture of constantly seeking handouts. Support, or at least acceptance of the beneficial aspects of British rule, clearly a modest conservative position arose from different motivations. Scholars like Narmada Shankar Dave and Bhagaji La saw opportunities in British rule at a particular point in time in history. Gokhale faced opposition for his moderate politics even when he lived. After his death under Gandhi's leadership, the Congress reduced its emphasis on constitutional change, but actually embraced the distaste for violent change with even greater gusto. Syed Ahmad Khan's views were almost a mirror image of Bakkim's. He felt that British rule was providential for India's Muslims and protected them from the tyranny of the majority. In pointedly encouraging Shia enrollment at, at Aligarh, Sir Syed was clearly hoping to create a band of brothers among India's Muslims. That is why Aligarh also tried to encourage Urdu as a common binding force among Indian Muslims. In this atmosphere, the Gujarati Muslim Bhagradin Tayamji actually forced his entire family to switch to Urdu. The question immediately pops up as to whether the band of brothers phenomenon can extend horizontally across both Hindus and Muslims. Almost a very central question when you study modern Indian politics. This, of course, has been a question that has continuously haunted all discussions there. Shriram should not be easily dismissed. During the 1857 uprising, there was an element of brotherhood from the Hindu and Muslim Sikhs who fought to defend their dharma and their deen, as Shriram Shri brilliantly points out. They even chose a common tactical leader in the aged emperor in Delhi. We will discuss this more, more of this in the section of politics. 
Drosha Mehta Madhrajan Chayati Lajpat Raya Madhavya and Shri Swami Raya in their own ways represented different aspects of conservative politics in the pre-Gandhi era. Sapro Shankar Naya Jai, Jai Karan Shri Mastrasthi distanced themselves from Gandhi's extra constitutional methods. These individuals along with Ram Swami Madhuryar, Shanmukam Chetty, Frank Morris and Shant Prasad Mukherjee can be viewed as bedrock political conservatives. Meanwhile, a conservative caucus developed within Gandhi's caucus. This group was particularly suspicious, particularly suspicious of the leftist tendencies of both and both and Air, as well as those of the new form caucus Socialist Party, which included figures like Jay Prakash Narayan. This conservative caucus within the Congress included Rajendra Prasad Patel, Pan Rajgopalajari, Gordon Loy, Sita Ramaya, and Roy among others. In the princely states, several important political conservatives emerged. They included the visionary Vishweshwaraya, the brilliant M.A. Srinivasan, the sober and energetic Mirza Ismay, as well as the eccentric and controversial C.P. Ramaswamy Raya. While talking of two seminal and important figures in modern India, Mahatma Gandhi and Dr. Baker, the question arises as to whether they were conservatives. Gandhi disdained violence and virtually expelled those from the Congress party for preaching revolutionary violent action, among other things. So while there are conservative features to Gandhi's thinking, I do not want to make a claim to conservative ownership of Gandhi, as this would ensure that the debate gets hijacked into the sphere and that other aspects of the argument are informed. I cannot resist the temptation to point out that many leftist academics, in fact, do argue that, that the Mahatma was a conservative. Am I supposed to say touche, or am I supposed to buy a copy of Spindrift as proof of my support for feminism? Be it aside. Ambedkar is equally problematic. Politically, he was a conservative, supporting British rule right through the Quit India days. He was also a thorough constitutionalist. Again, if I claim it as one of our own, with some legitimate grounds, the discussion will get sidetracked. Let us leave this aside. The same is the case with Jyotiba Pune and Divi Ramaswamy Nayaka, both political conservatives who, conservatives who supported British rule but who were radical in their social visions. I think it is wise for no one to try and claim these brilliant and enigmatic individuals in their entirety. You may also be wondering why I have so far not mentioned Sadarkar, Godwarkar, NPR, Munjay, and Dean Dayan. In my opinion, and I'm not shy about saying this, Hindu nationalism is either a valid and legitimate subset of Indian conservatism or is a movement which has significant overlaps with conservatism. But introducing these names into my statements regarding lineage will once again hijack the discussions. I will deal with them later. You might know that I've also excluded from my list both Muhammad Iqbal and Mari Malaya Rivet, who were interested in altering current paradigms in order to fit into one of a glory associated with a distant past. Their search had less of the elements of the Renaissance spirit and more of a reactionary tone. They both also had separate lenses through which they viewed India. Given that sobriety demanded that the British contribution of imposing political unity on India was on balance a positive one, separatism can hardly be accepted as conservative in its spirit. Jinnah, while starting as a conservative, ended up as a Jacobin. To give up the benefits of two centuries of gradual evolution of Indian political unity and to opt for a drug surgery is not something that conservatives can appreciate. Conservatism is fluid, empirical, and local in its manifestations, despite its universalist bias. Americans are still arguing whether Lincoln was a conservative. A hundred years from now, we will still be arguing for this matter about Gandhi and Abbeck. I was tempted to respectfully avoid talking about Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, the self-proclaimed anti conservative but that would be a mistake. I need to acknowledge that on many occasions I find his quotations useful. I must assume, therefore, that there were sensible, sensitive, and doubtless conservative parts to him. Bose is more difficult. He did not write much. He certainly had a link with Vivekananda and Bengali into revivalism, but in some sense he was the archetypal leftist Jacobin, imbued with a fiery idealism that was conducive to charisma, something that conservatives distrust. Balanced with its universalist favor is the fact that conservatism is biased to 
towards the local, the patriotic, the national. As my eldest son Vijay put it, conservatism is opposed to universalist ideology, even as it's advanced universal. In general, we do not hold that there are universal solutions possible for all societies or countries. We believe that each society will have to develop institutions and processes that are directly related to the history, geography, traditions, and culture of that individual group. That does not mean that we can compromise with the principle of the supremacy of the individual and her agency, which we need to remember appeared self-evident to Jefferson and rightly so. A society that does not meet this test fails in the eyes of conservatives. This, of course, implies that there are good and better societies and good and better qualities, as opposed to those that are bad and worse. The Soviet Union, Communist China, Nazi Germany, contemporary Saudi Arabia and Iran are quite simply speaking on the bad end of the spectrum, while Western democracies India and India are at the better end of the spectrum. But please note that they are by no means perfect. Relative imperfection is always seen as better than ending up with the bad while pursuing the obsessive perfections that tyrants seek. Given our belief in the impossibility of perfection, we are forever on the road for gradual improvements that head towards that impossible destination. The US founding fathers had it right. Our search is always for a more perfect not the most, the perfect union. The view that conservatives love the old and oppose all change is both simplistic. Conservatives are for certainly not reactionaries. Conservatives only love those parts of the old and inherited which are constructive, creative, and not dysfunctional. We are committed to change, which as Heraclitus observed, and as the Ajayveda articulates, is inevitable. We, however, do not believe in jettisoning those features of the past which are worth preserving, and which many times we feel are worth cherishing. In our view, the principal challenge faced by societies is as to how to change constructively without in the process of changing, losing things of value. We are therefore in principle opposed to revolutionary change, preferring the evolutionary variety any day. When confronted with arguments that everything needs to be pulled down, we are both amused and horrified. In political terms in recent times, the French Revolution, in our opinion, serves as a good example of the folly of revolution. About the so-called glorious October Revolution of the Bolsheviks, the less said the better. One must grudgingly admire the communists. They managed to imitate the worst features of Zionist Russia, and they brought to their imitative efforts a level of ruthless efficiency which the flabby czars could never have pulled off. These movements almost invariably result in a reign of terror and social and political institutions which are out of their time and which need change are replaced with caricatures of the constructive. There are times, however, when powerful forces of society fail to understand and appreciate the need for evolutionary change. The stubborn unwillingness of the leadership of the American South to accept the need for abandoning the institution of slavery resulted in a war becoming the instrument of that change. However, the byproduct of such change induced by violence almost always leaves behind a bitter aftermath and wounds that do not get settled for generations, as was the case in the American South and was also the case in post-revolutionary France. We saw for a minute here. The distinction is when Hamilton got rid of slavery in New York. He did it by legislation and compensated the slave owners. The stupid southern aristocrats didn't understand this. They fought a war and they had to be beaten for slavery to go away. That leaves, that violence and Sherman's march from Atlanta to the sea leaves the bigger aftermath, which to this day is there. To this day, there are southerners who want conservative statues, uh, Confederate statues. Conservatives are acutely aware that a love for the particular, the community, the society, the country can sometimes develop along pathological lines. This was the problem of the extreme Slavophile intellectuals in Russia and romantic monarchists in France who succumbed to the anti-Dreyfus movement. 
Abandoning Fukuzaka's sober conservatism and opting for shrill demagogue voices brought Japan to the unfortunate demagogue, the ultimate caricature of conservatism, which incidentally was totally opposed by many conservatives who was seen in the 20th century Germany. But no philosophy or doctrine can and should be judged by its pathological aberrations. The German concept of Heimat, which is in its homeland, can be tender as a Christian resort. On the other hand, the concept of folk, people, folk, deteriorating into the concept of head and folk, which is superior people, which is not about loving one's own people, but asserting superiority over others can be disastrous in a catastrophe, as it was for Germany. Conservatives tend to say as supporters of market based solutions in the economic sphere. The market where people meet, negotiate, and transact is an ancient human institution that has organically developed in different societies. It requires the voluntary acquiescence of individuals who are so dear to conservatives. It does not involve forceful interventions by any kind. It mandates easy entry and exit, almost exuding the spirit of liberty in that process. It is remarkably peaceful and peaceful in its conduct. It is based on trust among participants, and it enhances the factor of trust, which is such a key lubricant in human intercourse. Contemporary leftist criticism of markets is based on setting up a straw man who they refer to as exploitative monopolists without bothering to understand that defenders of markets are usually the strongest opponents of monopolistic practices. In the cultural sphere, conservatives tend to be committed even obsessive lovers of tradition and heritage. The great cultural achievements of our forebears are always to be treated with respect and many times with wonderment. In the social sphere, conservatives attach great importance to institutions like the family, which may actually have its advantages in our evolutionary biology, and which have been time tested in many societies which we consider admirable. We also have a fondness for voluntary associations with the sports club, the trade guild, the chamber of commerce, the Bhajan Mandali, the Sangeeta Sabha, and so on, which have evolved organically to become important institutions. We are aware that these institutions can atrophy and require frequent regeneration for constructive change. Changing the bathwater water is completely in order as long as the baby is sick. In political matters, we are always for gradual constitutional change and are opposed to breakneck revolutionary change. And we are always on the watch as to whether the proposed change enhances individual freedoms or contains them. In the aesthetic realm, we have a preference for traditional patterns and styles. We believe that these are evolved over time, taking in mind the needs and sensibilities of generations gone past, and that itself gives itself a value worth taking seriously. My friend Ram Goa has raised an important question, which one cannot run away from. After all, empiricism, support for incremental change, rejection of utopias, etc., can be seen as core principles of liberalism. What then is the difference between conservatism and liberalism? To my mind, the single biggest distinction lies in the difference in thinking between Hobbes and Rousseau. Hobbes meaning that all civilization was an attempt, all civilization was an attempt by humans to gradually move from their brutish beginnings to a better but not necessarily perfect present. In Indian terms, the proper practice of Artha and Dharma takes us away from Atsyanya. Rousseau believed that all of civilization represents social oppression that attempts to imprison primitive humans who are inherently noble. Liberals are de uh, they therefore tend to attack traditions and customs. Many of them will find the concept of a band of brothers inherently oppressive. It is true that liberals are like to rather a state of incremental change, but they derive the desired direction of change from theoretical abstractions like utility, common good, and so on, not from lived reality. Hence their disdain for the wisdom of the common true, which is the expression Burke uses for the swain. The theoretically well-armed liberal summer knows what is best for the swain. Conservatives invariably believe that not, not only we do not know what is best for anyone, but also that tampering with the inherited wisdom can be dangerous. Despite not advocating violence in the immediate establishment of a revolutionary state, 
Liberals, liberals in fact, are utopians in their goals. They believe that human beings have created human problems. And that if we pass laws and set up institutions, these problems can be solved. Conservatives believe that many, even perhaps most human problems, are inherent in our predicament and destiny. Tinkering can at best ameliorate bits and pieces, and some kinds of tinkering may make things worse. Starting with their founding guru, Rousseau, liberals have a profound sense of grievance against society, against the way humans have organized themselves until now. That is why you find liberals at the forefront of all movements based on victimhood and grievance mongering. The support that is given by both liberals and conservatives for markets is an overlap which is particularly prone to misunderstanding. Liberals favor markets because they work or can be made to work to pursue liberal goals. If tomorrow it can be shown that central planning works better at reducing inequalities or at empowering select minorities, which are typical liberal goals, then their attachment to markets will disappear. Conservatives will continue to oppose central planning as inherently immoral and undesirable. Markets are organic, evolved, voluntary human endeavors. Central planning is imposed involuntarily and a violation of Raja Dharma in Indian terms and in Anglo Saxon terms of the rights to liberty and private property. In recent times, we find many persons who call themselves liberals abandoning their emphasis on the individual and opting for the protection of group identities, especially when these groups are seen as oppressed. This has resulted in a perverse distortion of liberalism. This effort contrasts completely with the Hag's attempt to create a band of brothers feeling across lords and peasants. It starts with a hard hypothesis that peasants and aristocrats can never be members of the same band. <coughs> it goes on to argue that gay peasants or female aristocrats are subgroups that need particular hand-holding, especially against hegemons who can be white and male in the West and upper caste and male in India. Liberal thinkers are often seduced into the sinister trap. Conservatives know that. These artificial group identities are imagined and created precisely in order to destroy traditions. Too often persons of the liberal persuasion seem to like change as an end in itself because they are so unhappy with the presence. Conservatives, on the other hand, are clear that we want to change in order to conserve the best in our past. We simply will not part with precious legacies passed on to us by dead white males or by dead upper caste males, viewing them only through the lens of power and oppression. Even if there is an element of that, we will alter, we will change, but we will not completely abandon. One can round it off by going back to the well-known conservative position that we are part of a contract, not only among the living, but also with our ancestors and with generations yet to come. We are trustees of this earth and of the better parts of these things, of those things handed to us by our ancestors as we pass, pass those precious trusts onto our children and theirs. While there are conservatives who are simultaneously atheists, it is true that most conservatives a soft spot for religion, both for the practical consideration that religion tends to provide the most stable bedrock for ethical commerce among individuals, and from the inside, that the religious engagements of our ancestors represent some of the finest parts of our human inheritance. I hope that these lectures with the conclusion that I will state in advance that it stays in your mind as you listen to the rest of my verbiage in order that more support and exasperation and interest. Quite simply speaking, conservatism is a philosophy spanning various realms of human endeavor, the economic, the cultural, the social, the political, and the aesthetic, has an extraordinarily important contribution to make, a contribution which does not receive sufficient academic or public attention in recent times in India. It might hold many answers, even if imperfect, to engage with, engaging with and dealing with the numerous conundrums of our perilous times, and perhaps even more perilous times ahead. We take a little bit of a break, and then I go to modern Indian conservatism and the cultural sphere. I'm going to skip the economic one, because I think the cultural sphere. I'm going to fast.
fast or a little too fast? Okay. That happens when you read. Okay. <coughs> Switching to matter structure. Indian conservatives have had to deal with almost a foundational question. Is there such a thing as Indian culture? If it exists, is it recently imagined in the Benedict Anderson mode, or is it one where the imaginings have a respectable tradition going back in time? This is particularly important because of India's size, geographic diversity, and historical discontinuities. It is easy to forget the 16 medium-sized European countries can be squeezed into a scale map of India. It is also a fact that no Indian monarchical institution shows a firmly and coherently recorded, unbroken, continuous chronology from the year 1066 CE and from the year 508 CE. Those of you who are wondering what 508 is, should read the asterisk. Both foreign and Indian scholars frequently tell us that it is outsiders who refer to us as Indians. This would imply that there is no indigenous imagined idea of India or India of any degree of antiquity. The Marxist and post-colonial scholars have come up with a new kind of orientalism. They pretty much agree with 19th century British administrators and missionaries that not only was the political unification of India entirely a British affair, but the emergence of a so-called Indian national culture was simply the result of British rule and had no earlier roots possible. The high Sanskritic version which argued that Bharata Varsha extended from the bridge on the ocean to the abode of snow, to Imachara, as a definite geographic idea going back in time, was dismissed then by British members of the Vice Vice Council and are now dismissed by today's academics. This Sanskrit imaginary is seen as a defensive upper caste Hindu elite response to the attack by Western Enlightenment votaries and Christian missionaries. Even the Ramayana and the Mahabharata are rejected as, as pan-Indian projects. And the Bhagavad Gita is simply positioned as something that desperately different upper caste Hindus needed to exaggerate and deify in order to show that they too had a Bible, the equivalent of a Bible, which the new conquerors possessed. Wendy Doniger was enormously influential in both American and in Indian academic circles peddles this view. The fact that the Bhagavad Gita was considered a part of the Prasthanakaya or three authoritative texts of Vedanta some 13 centuries ago is glossed over because anything to do with Shankara is doubtless characteristic of Brahminical hegemony. We should simply ignore such commentators who in our vocabulary are put on this earth in order to propagate daitya or demonic points of view and who practice kutarka, which translates as wicked logic. We must fall back to chapter 15 of our celestial song. But the Lord is compared to India's eternal symbol, the people tree. It sounds more resonant in Sanskrit. At the risk of forcing some of you to consult dictionaries, let me just say, Ashwatthamena Suvirudha Mula. The 19th century European views of India were also deeply colored by a theory that, our theory that upper caste Indians were the descendants of Indo-European Aryans who had gone native in India by intermingling with Dravidian, Mongolian, and Austrian races. Such intermingling and the elevating climatic conditions of the Indian Peninsula presumably had turned the Aryans into a bunch of weak, effeminate losers. On this theory was overlaid one more: of Aryan race oppression being at the root of India's caste system, justifying an aggressive counter response for those who were quite arbitrarily classified as descendants of a Dravidian race. The Dravidian race was almost single-handedly invented by the activist Protestant missionary, the Reverend Caldwell. 
The subaltern school of Indian historians may not have entered, uh, intended it, but their studies have emphasized diversities and the need to go beyond dynastic and elite narratives. That's coming useful for a wide, a wide variety of Marxists and crypto Marxists who dismiss the idea of an overarching Indian culture, not necessarily by any factual analysis, but by indulging in value-added criticism referring to all attempts at defending an indigenously imagined in ancient Indian culture as simply an exercise in trying to reassert upper caste, Brahmin, Rajput, Vanya, Hindu, patriarchal, exploitative, quasi-racist, wannabe, Aryan, Nishman. They miss the point that the discussion is about culture and not about religion. Not just the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, but the Jataka days do need to be moved as part of the ancient palaces of Indian culture. The anti Hindu bias comes in handy for those who wish to demolish the idea of ancient Indian culture with a semblance of unity. The political case for this is simple. If an ancient Indian cultural unity is denied, then we are left with a territorial state following frontiers defined by the British, and this state can be a cultural desert. Colonial semantics define Hindus as a religious group. Would it have worked differently if Hindus had been defined as a cultural group? We should not fall into this trap. We are talking about an enduring Indian or Indic culture that is not to be left to the mercy of the vocabulary of arbitrary classifications that our critics have control over. We must pay attention to the fact that Indonesia and Thailand are able to view the Ramayana as part of their cultural heritage. One is a largely Muslim country and one is a largely Buddhist one. But when it comes to India, we get shy and embarrassed to say so because our texts get classified as religious. Gurjaran Das was actually confronted in Delhi salons when he talked about his interest in the Mahabharata. The Chattaraki of our capital city asked him contemptuously if he had become a Hindu fundamentalist. Note the derision for the Mahabharata and the embarrassment involved in even calling someone a Hindu. I would argue that the best response is to ignore such foolish questions. Let us remember Scruton's position that respect for the traditional culture of the majority, however we choose to define the majority, is not something to be ashamed of. It is something to be cherished. The Indian conservative response to the colonial stereotypes and the more recent Marxist and postmodern orientalism has been sensitive, sensible, intrepid, and firm. Even Bandit Nehru, an army we call a person of the conservative persuasion, had his moments of conservative epiphany. His conversations with Andre Malgro, Malgro his introspections while sitting, sitting on the steps of the Borobudur temple in Java, his luminous last will and testament that points to me so much with his writing shows him up to be one who would have argued vociferously that the idea of Indian culture is solid and is ancient. Being sentimentally attached to the vein of Krishna and to Alabar, Pandit Ji could not escape the northern Indian geographic bias. Tagore, who hailed from the eastern frontiers of the peninsula, had the more interesting approach of dealing with the challenge of diversity. He simply acknowledged them, even celebrated them. Vows, Vidyapati, Vaishnava lyrics were all important for the Bengali Bhagalo poet. At the risk of making a personal intrusion, I would like to tell you a story. When my grandparents visited the world, this poet, poet spent the major part of an evening discussing Mysore and Tanjore Venas and the importance of making sure that both. Rosewood and Jackwood Venas were produced. The God celebrated India's diversities. He wrote a short story, Ambi Stones, when he was visiting Ahmedabad in Gujarat. And he said, Janagana Marana Music, when he was visiting Madanapali in Andhra. And in so doing, affirmed India's unity. Mind you, he did this not in a shortest way, but with the solid conviction that India had something peaceful, creative, and constructive to offer to the world. The European argument that cultures were co-terminous with nation-states, with hard frontiers, 
single languages, homogeneous, in, homogeneous inhabitants, and perfect, preferably one religious confession, was a political argument. And that is the argument used by British administrators against a political formation known as India. Very well, we simply agree. We invoked our word spirit. We then go on to make it the case that the Indian cultural movement we speak of, speak of exists despite no political unity, despite no hard frontiers, despite no homogeneity in the population, despite no linguistic uniformity, or even religious denominational closeness. That is the aha moment for those of us who imagine an indigenous foundational Indian culture of considerable activity. We do have an Indian culture, and we describe it and celebrate it in our vocabulary. In our vocabulary. And we are not able to convince ICS officers, Anglican missionaries, or tenured professors at American universities, and quite frankly, that is their problem, not ours. They will keep arguing that we are wrong, that we suffer from an inferiority complex, that we are just being reactive mimics, and of course, patriarchal, hegemonic, etc. But guess what? We will be obdurate complete of these. The words will mean what we say. The classical Sanskrit ideas of a culture that permeates the geography of the peninsula will not disappear because Western scholars and their Indian acolytes don't like them. Consider our myths, we use Pandit Nehru's melodious expression, legend, myth, story, and song. Rama, Sita, and Lakshmana stay on the banks of the Godavari at a place called Panchavati, which we now call Nasik. Rama has a dialogue with the king of the oceans at Darbhashayana at a spot a few miles away from a place called Rameshwar. He worships Shiva. He is the same prince who has come all the way from Saketa on the banks of the Sarai. Bhima and Arjuna wander all over the land that we call Bhartavarsha, marrying different damsels and promoting a raunchy national integration that of course will be condemned by our critics as badly patriarchal, but never mind. And even the name, does it come from the Bharata tribe or from the son of the beauteous Shakuntala and the not so likable Dushyanta? It is a land where black bucks roam, tigers rule, peacocks strut, lotuses bloom, mangoes blossom, jasmine suffuse our olfactory nerves, poils call, and where the crown bird inspires Valmiki, our Adikavi, our tribal poet. And it is not only in the realm of myth that we make claims to, myth, claims to antiquity. Let us consider history. Why would a Rashtra Kuta king in modern Maharashtra and a Pallava king in modern Tamil Nadu build a temple for Shiva, who is worshipped all over our land, and refer to Shiva as Kailashanatha, the Lord of Kailasha, which is in the distant northern Himalayas? And these temples were not built as a response to British rule or an account of Western inspiration. They were built some 1500 years ago. Why would Tamil poets refer to Krishna as a god as Vada Madurai, the northern Madurai, and not just as Mathura? Why would Andar create a Gokul in Srivili Kutu in the distant south? And of course, whether Marxists agree with us or not, we hold that some 13 centuries ago, Adi Shankara established religious institutions in the extremities of Bhartavarsha, Joshimat in the north, Shringeri in the south, Dwarka in the west, and Puni in the east. Pankaj Jarma captures the romance and the febrile energy of Adi Shankara with great form. We hold that some 10 centuries ago, Ramanuja went all the way from Kanchipuram and Tamil Nadu to Sharda in Kashmir, which is now a ruined village on the other side of the Arrow Sea in order to obtain a well-preserved manuscript of the Brahma Sutras. Three o'clock or two thirty? Oh, I thought it was three, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. uh, and some eight centuries ago, Madhava went from Udupi in coastal Karnataka to Badina and Uttarakhand. We can continue on this. But the point, I think, has been made. There is an Indian culture, and that was to make academics. They don't know what works.